Excellent. We are good to go. All right. Um, what I want to do today uh, is talk about gates and gate transitions. Um, and let me begin by showing you uh, a couple of video clips um, just to sort of get you thinking about uh, how animals move. And, and we'll start, um, uh, who should we look at first? Um, but, well, let's look at, uh, oh, good Lord. Oh, nice, nice, nice. There you go. Can you see it? No, you can't see it. The reason you can't see it is because the projector is not. All right. Hey. There we go. There we go. Give it a minute to warm up. Uh, the first little video clip that I'm going to show you uh, is for a lesser panda. Um, lesser pandas are kind of uh, weird. Um, everybody knows what a lesser panda looks like. You've seen them at the St. Louis Zoo. If you go to the St. Louis Zoo, there's that exhibit right next to the prairie dogs, right? Uh, lesser pandas, uh, well, let's see if you can figure out what they are. I'll wait for it to, and let's uh, start this thing over here. It'll get brighter. Uh, let's turn up some other lights. There, now you can see the lesser panda. You can see his butt. At any rate, let's start it over. Um, uh, oh, yeah, there we go. So what does it look like? Yeah, it looks like a raccoon. And, it, and if you listen to the docents at the St. Louis Zoo, uh, they're going to give you a story about how they're closely related to raccoons. They're not. Okay? Um, all this stuff right here is bamboo. So these guys are from Asia, right? They're Chinese. Um, it's probably where the China virus came from. Okay? But these guys are, are what, what other animal is in China that eats bamboo? Panda. Pandas. So these guys are the lesser pandas, and the black and white ones are the greater pandas. What do you know about greater pandas? What's weird about them? What are they? They're bears. They're bears, right? So they really are bears. They're related to grizzlies and polars and black bears and all that sort of stuff, okay? And Malaysian sun bears and all the weird bears, okay? But when you, what, what do they, do they eat meat? No, they don't. Bears have a GI tract, which is really short. Carnivores have really short GI tracts, okay? Herbivores have really long GI tracts. Why is that? That's because protein is easy to digest. Plant material is very hard to digest. So if you want to digest plant material, it has to stay in your GI tract a long time so that you have more chances at absorbing any nutrients out of it. So that's one problem. So here you are, you're a carnivore, and you have a short GI tract, and yet, like these guys and like uh, panda bears, you have a short GI tract which means that in terms of the total nutrition you're going to get out of any mouthful, it's pretty limited. So what do panda bears do? They eat. They eat. They eat. They eat some more. They eat some more. They sit on their butt and eat. They eat. They eat. They eat. They eat. Do they frolic? Do they go out on dates? I wish. <laughs> they don't, right? They don't have time for that nonsense. And if you look at the offspring that they make, their offspring are these little tiny things, right? Like pinkies. Because they don't have the energy, right, to bring this thing in utero to full size. So it's sort of a challenging position that they've locked themselves into. Well, these guys are also pandas. The other thing that you notice on a 
greater panda is it has six digits. Well, it has five, like every other bear, right? And like every other vertebrate. And it does not have opposable digits. So its claws go like that. But if you look at the greater panda, it has this extension of the radial sesamoid bone, which sticks out like that and looks like a thumb. And when a greater panda eats, it takes that bamboo shoot and puts it between that extension of the radial sesamoid, the, the thumb, right? And strips the leaves off like that and then consumes all of these leaves in bulk. So here's this guy also eating bamboo, but it's not a raccoon. It just looks like a raccoon, okay? And they are arboreal. Unfortunately, I don't have any nice footage because these guys are rarely in a position where you can get nice footage of them walking around or something. Um, but you can look at them a little bit and figure out what kind of gait they have. Let's look at... Um, these guys. Anybody know what they are? Alpacas. Yamas. Yamas. Okay. How, uh, so what, what family do these guys belong to? Which mammalian family do they belong to? Anybody know? I don't know the name of it, but isn't it the same one camels occupy? Yep, it's in the family Camelidae. Okay, so okay, wait a minute. So where did these guys come from? South America. South America. Where are all the other camels? They're usually in Africa. Yeah. Well, all they dipped in shit. That's sort of a broad distribution. South America and Africa. What does that tell you about the origin of the family Camelidae? very old. It's old, right? So in other words, that family diversified before all of these continents split apart. Where do horses have their evolutionary origin? It is in North America. They're North American, right? But they went extinct in North America. When the Indians were here, the Indians didn't have horses. Wait, you say. Every Western movie I ever saw, the Indians were really good at riding horses. Sure they were. But they didn't get horses until the Spaniards came over. So the horses evolved here in North America, went extinct in North America, but it already spread to the Old World, right? And we're there in Europe and Eurasia. And when Columbus came, he reintroduced the horses. And, interestingly enough, the Indians never invented the wheel. And that's one of the reasons why the white man, when he got here, viewed the Indians as savages, because they didn't even have the effing wheel. Well, what good is a wheel if you don't have a draft animal? A wheelbarrow. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose. Okay. So, it... Anybody familiar with the uh, Chaco Canyon in, uh, in New Mexico? Do you, are you guys familiar with the Anasazi um, nation? There were, there were three major uh, Anasazi cities, Canyon de Chez, uh, Mesa Verde, and um, Chaco Canyon. So uh, Mesa Verde in Colorado, uh, Chaco Canyon in New Mexico, and then uh, Canyon de Chez in Arizona. And from satellite imagery, you can see the trails that the Anasazis use to go from one city to the next. And if you find those trails, you go down on the ground, you can find the pottery shards that they were using to transport water. Okay? It's really a cool system. But if you go to a Chaco Canyon, the Anasazis had adobe cliff dwellings, but they had, they had multi-level uh, apartment buildings built into these cliffs. And the floors on each apartment unit were made out of ponderosa pine vega. If you're, in, if you're in Chaco Canyon, the closest ponderosa pines are 100 miles away. So you ask yourself, well, where did they get those ponderosa pines to form the vegas for the, the floors between their apartment buildings? And the answer is, they didn't have horses, so they walked. Oh, wait, back in those days, the ponderosa pine forests were right there in 
the canyon. No, they weren't. From pollen records, we know that ponderosa pine were never in Chaco Canyon. So the Indians walked 100 miles. So think of what that means. So you get a bunch of guys together, and they all go walking off 100 miles, camp out overnight. Probably takes them a couple of days to do this. They find this ponderosa pine tree, hack it down with a stone axe, hoist it up on their shoulders, and walk back 100 miles and drop it off. Turn around, go get another one. They didn't have horses, so they did it by themselves. Okay. At any rate, pay careful attention to how these guys move. And what do you notice that's weird? Especially when they're when they're moving fast. Oh, there's something racing by in the background. Notice anything? Look at it again. Think about how your horse or your dog walks. Yeah, it looks like they push off both their back legs almost. It's sort of a semi-bound when they go fast, but look carefully. Compare the left and the right sides. Even when they're walking slow, compare what's happening with the left limbs and the right limbs. They alternate. There, it's a contra. It's called a contralateral gait. So first, it's the appendages on this side. Then it's the ones on this side. Then it's the ones on this side. Why is that weird? Because that means for a short bit. You've got two legs up like that, which means you can tip over. Okay? Why is that a problem? That's a problem because think about how you walk. Okay? When you walk, where does the real cost come from? So think about the cost of moving for you. Anybody ever had a job where you stood in one place for a very long time? Maybe you're, the, you're working the checkout counter at Schnucks, okay? They don't let you sit down at Schnucks. They let you sit down at Aldi. Where would you rather work? Aldi. Aldi, me yeah, too. It's a union job. Aldi is union? Mm -hmm. Hell yeah, man. Aldi is like the best uh, grocery company, hands down, pretty much. Yeah, how about them Germans, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fucking Germans. <laughs> <laughs> so, when you stand there after an eight-hour shift, man, your dogs are barking. You ache all over. Okay? Why? Balance. Is balance? What else are you doing as you're just standing there? What muscles are you using? Your legs, it's just compression. Right? A little bit of muscle action there. A little, not a lot. Just a little bit in your legs to keep them straight. Where is the primary muscular energy being expended? the sacrospinalis group of muscles, those muscles which go from, from your um, ilium all the way up your vertebral column, holding you erect like that. It's a very dense group of muscles, very dense. They get very tight, right? You have to, if you do yoga, you know those are the muscles you really have to work on to keep them stretched out and so on. You're spending a lot of energy on That's called the cost of posture. So it's the postural cost of locomotion. So you're expending energy just standing there like that. If you lay down flat on your back, you're no longer expending that energy. Now you're going to walk. Okay? So how do you walk? Right? In an exaggerated way, your hips, what, I mean, different people do it in different, but your body has this tendency to rise and fall. <coughs> So your take, it's almost as though your limbs are working like a pendulum. Only this time the pendulum is, instead of being suspended from your hips and going like that, like a grandfather clock, it's upside down. And you're swinging from your heel over the top and then back down. So it's an upside down pendulum. 
And the result of that is that you rise and fall. Every time you rise, that takes energy. Okay? So now you would think, oh, the faster I go, the more expensive it's going to be. But it turns out, no. And the reason it's not more expensive to go faster, I mean, at some point it changes, right? But the reason it doesn't cost you more, right, in a relative way, it costs you exactly the same. And the reason for that is, is because you're spending less time on the postural cost, and you're spending less time on, or less energy on the rise and fall. If you look at how people walk, people that are efficient walkers, they're not rising and falling, okay? You walk very steady. You're minimizing the cost of locomotion. When these guys walk, just as camels do, just as giraffes do, these legs first, then these legs. Horses don't do that, okay? Horses are alternating this one and this one, and then this one and this one. Those are two fundamentally different gates. All right, let's look at somebody else. Who else do we have in here that's sort of interesting? I don't know if this guy moves or not, but this is another cool example. Anybody know what it is? Hyena. Spotted hyena. Yeah, spotted hyena. The first thing, just looking at him, what do you notice about the structure of that animal that's weird? The hind limbs are significantly shorter than the forelimbs. Yeah, so this animal has forelimb dominance rather than hind limb dominance. Almost every other animal, the back legs are longer than the front legs. Okay? So that's one weird thing about hyenas. The other weird thing is notice the ears are round. Okay? The hell's that all about? Let's see if he'll turn and face us. Come on, yeah, there you go, almost. Okay. So look at the snout. What's what? Who do you think these guys would be closely related to evolutionarily? Canids. To canids? You'd think so. You'd think so because they have that nice dog-like snout, right? There's a cool thing about hyenas, and that's this jaw. The lower jaw is shaped basically like that. So it's very small at the front end and very thick and deep at the back end. And when these guys bite, they can generate bite forces that are so significant, they can walk up to any person in this class, grab your thigh, bite down, and snap your thigh right off in one bite. They wouldn't have to chew on it. At the St. Louis Zoo, you know those rawhide bones that you can buy for your dog to play with? Okay, and they'll chew on it for a couple of weeks or something like that until it's all nasty and shit, and you then throw it away. They give these guys rawhide bones that are that thick around. And I've watched them walk up to that rawhide bone, the animal will sit down, put it in its mouth, bite once, and split it in half, just like that. These dudes are badass, okay? So it turns out they're not dogs. They're cats. They're more closely related to the cats. They are in a group called the feliforms rather than the caniforms. And we know that based on the allosphenoid canal, which is this little bony structure at the back of the jaw, or at the back of the um, upper jaw. All right, so there is another interesting aspect to these guys. Uh, somewhere I have footage of these guys walking. Uh, it might be here. There we go. Hey, what do you notice about the gait? Contralateral, just like, just like in, the, uh, in the Yamas, okay? One extra cool little thing about these guys, they have sexual dimorphism. We have sexual dimorphism, right? Humans are sexually dimorphic. Males are bigger than females. These guys have reverse size dimorphism. Females are bigger than males. Uh-oh. I wonder why that is. 
That's because the females are badass and the males are wusses. Okay? Have you ever watched these guys mate? It's got to be interesting. It is really, really, really interesting. It's not like the lions, okay? When lions mate, it is strictly business. The male roars, he grabs that female, just pounds her hips into the ground, right? Grabs her, bites her neck, mounts her, and wham, bam, you know? I mean, it's all business. You can hear it across the entire zoo, and your, your skeleton is just vibrating, and every hair on your body is standing on end because you know something really bad just happened, okay? These guys, when they mate, if you look at them, you put, put the male and the female side by side, you can see that one is bigger, but then you look at their genitals and you go, holy smokes, they're both males because they both have a penis. Except they don't. Only the male has the penis, but one of them is the female. The female has what's called a pseudo-penis. So from comparative anatomy, you know that the clitoris and the penis are homologous structures. They are exactly the same. So the nervous innervation is exactly the same. They both have erectile tissue on the inside, okay? The human penis, on average, is about six and a half inches long. How long is the human clitoris? About three inches long. You're going, wait a minute, not mine. Well, yeah, yours, but only a small part of it is exposed to the surface. The rest of it is deep, okay? So if you look at it, it's essentially the same stuff. These guys do exactly the same thing. The clitoris on the female is massive, and it's bigger than the penis on the male. Why? Why would that be the case? What happens to female bodybuilders that use steroids? What happens to male bodybuilders that use steroids? Their testes shrink. Pardon? Their testes shrink. Their testes shrink, right? Their prostates become the size of grapefruits. What else happens to male bodybuilders? Pardon my French? They get bitch tits. Okay? <laughs> So they start laying down all this adipose tissue right behind their nipples. There are clinics, even in St. Louis, that specialize in dealing with quote-unquote bitch tits and guys. Okay? In other words, the male becomes feminized. When a male takes all these steroids, He's actually becoming feminine. I mean, he puts on a lot of muscle mass in a hurry, but becomes feminized. What happens to a female? She becomes masculinized. Okay? So she starts losing adipose tissue from her breasts. Her voice deepens. She gets all this muscle mass, and her clitoris enlarges. So now... Think about the hyenas. What do you think's going on? Maybe they have some sort of hormone. Ah, the females have an awful lot of testosterone. Okay? So the, reasons the, the reason the females have such a large clitoris is because of the phenomenal levels of testosterone that they have. Testosterone makes you aggressive. The females are more aggressive than the males. The females are socially dominant over the males. Now, the females turn out to be really, really, really careful about who they mate with. And there's a reason for that. If you ever watch the mate, it's fun to watch. I mean, it's frustrating as heck for the male, but it is fun to watch as the casual observer. Because the female will stand still, and the male will come up behind her and attempt to mount her just like a dog, okay? And he has an erection, and he's trying to take that penis, and it turns out that the opening for her vagina is on the inside of the clitoris. So the clitoris is actually like a straw. 
And what he's going to do is he's going to try and take his penis and insert it inside the straw. Okay? So unlike humans where the clitoris sits above, here the vaginal opening is right through the middle. Holy smokes. In other words, and this is the fun part. The female is there and she's, yeah, okay, whatever, do it, you know, nah, nah, and she'll just shift her hips a little bit, move the tip of the clitoris over. I mean, he'll spend hours trying to line up and aim. And if she doesn't want to, it's not going to happen. I mean, she'll play with him all day long, get him all frustrated and angry and stuff, and there's not a darn thing he can do about it. Why is she like that? Because, think about it, what happens when she actually gives birth to the pups? They're going through that vaginal opening so that clitoris gets shredded when she gives birth. A lot of hyena, spotted hyena females die during the birth process. They don't make it. In other words, it's an extremely important decision on the part of it. They're not just going to casually mate with any old male. They're going to be exceedingly careful about which male they decide to mate with. All right. Let's look at somebody else. Who else do I have here that's kind of intriguing? Uh, let's see. I'm, this one may not be any good, but we'll see. I had to go all, all the way to Finland to see these guys. No, not that one. You'd think. It's a North American mammal. You'd think I'd be able to see it in North America. The answer is no. Wolverines. Wolverine, Gulo Gulo, the most badass animal on the planet. Oh, look at that. He's going, I'm going to fuck you up, man. <laughs> Give me something to kill. I want to kill. <laughs> He's coming after me. Okay. Anybody know what those guys are? Prey no, not prey dogs. These are gundies. <laughs> Little fat ass dude. Okay. Dude, he's staying stopped. <laughs> <laughs> he's looking out for the gold, gold wolverine. He knows he's out there somewhere. Oh, get the hell out of here. <laughs> Uh, the Gundis are, are South American. Um, they're really highly uh, social. Um, are they related to chinchillas? Yeah, uh, they, yeah they are. They are related to chinchillas. All right. I think I think he moves around a little bit. There you go. There's some locomotion for these guys. A lot of social stuff. Oh, yeah, 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 get that itch. Oh, dude, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> Anybody know what that is? Mongoose. Mongoose. All right, uh, let's skip over this guy. Anybody know what that is? <laughs> Wish I could do that with my nose. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody know what it is? Is it some kind of shrew? It is a shrew. Is it an elephant shrew? It is an elephant shrew. Okay. All right, let's see. Uh, I just have a couple more here that I want to show you. Uh, more yamas, more hyenas. Um, 
check this guy. Uh, that's a you went the ground squirrel uh, behaves just like a prairie dog. Prairie dogs are ground squirrels. Uh, this is in Wyoming. Uh, actually, this is at the AMK Field Station uh, in uh, Grand Teton National Park. The AMK Field Station is owned and operated by as a joint venture between U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and uh, University of Wyoming. It's a it's a cool place. It's very inexpensive to stay. Um, we did a field class out there, and I think we spent it was something like fifteen dollars a night to stay there with the whole class. Uh, and as a private person, you know, as long as you're involved in some kind of research, you can stay there. I think it's like five bucks a night or something, so it's really cheap. If you compare that with what you'll pay in a local hotel or something like that, uh, you'll spend four or five hundred dollars a night in a hotel around there. So this is really a good deal. Um, but they're doing the same sorts of things that prey dogs do, right? A lot of time spent being vigilant. All right, who else do I have here? Oh, uh, let's see. I got a couple additional cool things here. Uh, well, let's look at uh, let's look at this guy. Close this damn thing down. There we go. Good Lord. Uh, so this is the southern flying squirrel. This is in slow motion. very briefly about each of those different steps. Uh, this was filmed uh, in my lab. So let's, let's watch what happens here. Uh, this is the takeoff. Look at the tail, and look at the dust that's being kicked up, okay? So uh, how much force is this animal generating as it takes off, ballpark, do you think? If you measure force in terms of Gs, these guys are generating 8 Gs. So how many, how many G-forces do you have to tolerate when you're in a funny car or a top fuel dragster? About three or four. About three. Okay. So these guys are experiencing more than twice the gravitational forces that a top fuel dragster pilot is going to experience. Which is pretty significant. And you can tell by all the crud that's kicked up when he takes off. Okay. So in other words, taking off like that is energetically very expensive. So now he's, he's going through the air. Okay, you notice how the tail flipped up, right, like that. Initially the tail flipped up and it was kinked over at the end. Let's back it up. Watch the tail, the tip of the tail. See that? See how the tail gets pulled up like that? Um, I don't know if you guys know A.J. Hendershot from MDC. A.J. Hendershot, Jim Robbins, and I, we saw, we saw that, and we said, oh, man, this has got to be cool. So we were working with these aerospace engineers up at Boeing, trying to figure out exactly aerodynamically what was going on. And we were working on this paper trying to describe exactly what the aerodynamic consequences of that would be and trying to make this case that this is an adaptation to on um, gliding locomotion. And then we went and talked to somebody who actually knew something about the system. It was a comparative anatomist. And he says, ah, oh, no, no. The reason it does that is because of uh, the small group of muscles that are going from this part of the hip to this part of the hip 
And it's a simple consequence of moving both legs back at the same time. So it didn't have anything at all to do with what we thought it was. It was just simply an artifact of, of movement. Okay, so not everything you see is meaningful. Um, but now, as he goes a little bit farther forward, look what happens to his, look what he's doing with his appendages. Notice how they're moving. You see how they're going back and forth? What's that all about? Here you see it even better. Okay? So the, the legs on either side are doing this. Why is that the case? If you were to take a much bigger flying squirrel, a flying squirrel that weighed about a kilogram, they wouldn't do that. If you look at a, at a Kalugo, when they glide, they don't do that. So the big animals, when they take off, the limbs go out like that, and they're rock solid. These guys are doing all this sort of stuff. What's that about? It's because they're so small that they can lose their direction in the air really easily? Or? It's not about changing your direction. Think about it's all about stability. When you're a little kid learning to ride your bike for the first time, it's one of these things, right? It's all about controlling moments of inertia. When you're small, right, when you're small, it's difficult to control moments of inertia. When you're big, those moments of inertia are relatively much smaller, and it's much easier to control. So the big animal is really stable. The small animal is really unstable. So it's all about controlling moments of inertia. And notice what's happening right here. So there's the heel of his hand. What the heck is that stuff right out there? These guys have a little cartilage which sticks out from the wrist called the styliform cartilage. Just sticks out straight like that. So the skin stretches over the tip of that styliform cartilage. So when this guy glides, his hands go out like that. Okay, His hands come forward the styliform cartilage sticks out and supports the wingtip. Why not just do this? By doing this and having the wingtip out there, the wingtip flares up like that. What's that all about? What do you, if you've ever seen a bush plane in Alaska, what do the wingtips on a bush plane look like? They go straight up. At a 747, a jumbo jet that has to land on a short runway, what do the wingtips look like? They go straight up. Southwest Airlines 737s, so all the wingtips look like that because a lot of those planes land on short runways. When the wingtips go up like that, it minimizes turbulence at low speeds. And that's exactly what these guys are doing. They're trying to, they're flying slow. So they're minimizing the amount of turbulence so that they can keep lift even when they're going slow. Sugar gliders, which are marsupials, don't have that cartilage. On sugar gliders, the potassium, that membrane, comes up and attaches to the pinky finger. But when a sugar glider glides, it takes its hands out like that, puts the hands up like that so the hand makes the wingtip, and then they take their thumb, they have opposable thumbs, and the thumb points straight down like that. So they not only have a wingtip going up, but they have one going down. So even though they don't have the structure to do it, they're using the hands and they're mimicking it. All right, so this thing takes off with eight Gs. Coming in for a landing. And now the big question is, what the hell is this gliding business all about? There are a couple of ideas. One is that it helps them get away from predators. If that's true, it's not working. Because a single pair of northern spotted owls will consume 500 northern flying squirrels in a year. Okay? Next, okay, it's cheaper to glide than it is to move quadrupedally through the through the canopy, not if you're big, okay? Finally, it's either about foraging efficiency, all gliding animals cover much larger areas than non-gliding animals, so it allows you to visit more widely dispersed feeding locations. And the other idea is this, by having those potassia, 
Think about how much force, look what he's doing. The hands go forward, his head's going back, he's going, oh, fuck me. You know, he's keeping his head back like that. His legs are coming forward. The patasia are billowing out like a parachute. So when he hits that thing, remember he took off with eight Gs. He's got a lot of energy. By flaring out those patasia, he's slowing himself down. He's breaking, he's cutting his velocity by more than half. So he's really reducing the amount of energy on impact. If you're a male, you can appreciate that, what it's like to bang your testicles into a hard object, okay? And when these guys are reproductive, the testicles are significant, okay? I mean, they're not doing it to save their nuts, they're doing both the females and the males do it. But there's a lot of energy, whammo, okay? I want to show you one more, if I can find it. If I can find it, I want to show you where are they? Ah, here we go. Um, one of these. I think it's this one. Hey, hey, look at that gate. And everybody knows what animal that is, right? Pronghorn. It's a pronghorn antelope, nice, nice buck. Pronghorn antelopes, uh, they're the only, they're, they are the only true antelopes. All those animals that you call antelopes in Africa are not antelopes, okay? These are the only members of the family antelope capridae. They're weird in that the, the horns have a bony core. Look at that. Nice little gallop. Have a bony core and then a keratinaceous sheath. So it's not like the bony core and keratinaceous sheath in cows, right in the family Bovidae. He's, he's, that sagebrush that he's running through, uh, for those of you that don't know what sagebrush is, um, and there's a bunch of females nearby. There you go. He's just showing off. He's going, check this out, ladies. Okay, let's go. Uh, there's one more in that, a couple more in that sequence. Let's look at this one. Females are moving around. There's the male right behind all those females. He wants them all. Okay, he's not going to share. He's going, they're all mine, damn it. Come on, ladies. Play fair. In one of these sequences, uh, he gets spooked. They all get spooked and they start a chase. There we go. There we all right, let's go get him. Come on, come on. Yeah, now we're in business. Let's get those babes. Yeehaw. <laughs> oh, now he's just showing off. It's just like a high school kid with a fast car. You know, you got to show off. Come on, ladies, back this way. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> Love is in the air, man. You can you just know it. All right. So uh, here's what, uh, what we want to do. Um, let me get rid of this. What we want to do, we want to um, analyze the gates that these animals are using. Okay? Uh, and I will provide you uh, with these uh, little bits of video.
Uh, so I will put links to all those video clips up on the web page so you can grab those video clips at your convenience. You're going to need a couple of software programs to work with those video clips. All right? um, you're going to need, uh, who, who does not have a, a Windows-based machine? Everybody has a Windows-based laptop or computer or access to one? Okay. Um, which version of Windows are you running? Ten. Everybody has 10? Um, when you have Windows 10 in, the, in the, um, the little menu bar down at the bottom, type in as the search Movie Maker. Okay? Uh, you want to use Windows Movie Maker. Now, in Windows 7, uh, Movie Maker was the standard feature and it was a lot easier to work with than the Movie Maker program they have in, in, um, in Windows 10. Okay, they're trying to get rid of Movie Maker for some reason. I don't know why. Um, does anybody have access to um, Adobe Premiere? Yeah, if you use, do it in Adobe Premiere. What I want you to do is I want you to take those video clips and get rid of everything except the critical components where you can see all the limbs. You want to be able to see, watch this animal as it takes a number of steps and you want to see both the right and the left limbs. Because what you want to do is you want to see the footfalls when each foot is contacting the ground. Sometimes you can't see it exactly but by what happens to the leg, you'll know, oh yeah, he's in the contact with the ground now, okay? So get rid of everything except those, I mean, because there's a lot of stuff in here that you don't need. So the video clips that I'm going to put up, okay, and I'll, I'll get them up over the weekend some, at some point, I want you to take those and just trim them down to the barest developments, okay? Just the segments that you need. Then, what you're going to do is you're going to download a program called Earthen View. Earthen View comes out of, uh, it's a joint venture between a bunch of people in England and in Germany. Okay? Uh, so you're going to have to decide whether you want it in English or whether you want it in German. Okay? I, I suggest English. All right? It's a free program. Just type Google search Earthen View. I'll tell you what, I'll put it on this thing over here so you can see what the website looks like. So Google search. Let's use Google Chrome. All right, Earthen. Irfan View official homepage, one of the most popular, and that's the web page that you should come up with. So it's not a fancy, splashy web page. Uh, let me kill those lights so that you can so that you can see it. And uh, there's one more thing that you need to know. If you go up here across the top, it says download. And you can download the 32-bit or the 64-bit version. It's important which one you choose. If you have a 32-bit machine, use the 32-bit version. If you have a 64-bit machine, use the 64-bit version. Make sure you know which one you have. Go to the My Computer tab or the Control Panel, right? Find out, check out your processor discover whether you have a 32-bit processor or a 64-bit, okay? If your computer is newer, it's unlikely to be a 32-bit machine. So you're going to download the 64-bit version, okay? And it now gives you a whole list of options, right? So available 64-bit downloads, you're going to go down to one of these down here, download Earthen View 64 English, that's going to be the one you want, okay? So don't do it as a zip file, that just makes everything complicated, especially because a lot of Windows machines will not automatically unzip a zip file. They want you to buy the special program to unzip it, so don't do that. Make sure you have a good internet connection. If your internet connection is spotty, um, it, 
it can get interrupted and then it'll be corrupted and all sorts of things. There is a um, plugin uh, group that you can also download. Uh, plugins, uh, those plugins are actually pretty good. There's one plugin uh, so that you can do everything as JPEG images rather than uh, bitmaps. I don't care if you don't, if you don't keep it simple, don't worry about the plugins at this point if you don't want to. Or if you, if you have a lot of space on your computer, don't worry about the plugins. All right? So you're going to download that program, and what you're then going to do, once you have the program downloaded, you're going to use Irfan View to open up the video that you've created, which consists of all these individual short clips of the antelope walking, the antelope running, the yamas walking, the yamas running, the hyena walking, the wolverine walking, right? Um, the, I didn't show you the white-tailed deer, the white-tailed deer walking, okay? So I don't know, I probably have 10 different species that I'm going to put up there. You want enough under ideal circumstances so that you can get maybe five steps for each animal, okay? All right. Five steps walking, five steps running. Okay? You may not be able to get five, that's okay. Get what you can. But you're going to take that whole video clip now, okay? It'll probably only be a minute long or something after you've got everything edited down. It'll probably be less than a minute. You've got everything edited down. You're now going to take that video clip and open it up in Irfan View. Once you've got it in Irfan View, one of the things that you can do with it is extract all frames. These videos were shot at 29.97 frames per second. So 30 frames a second, okay? That means for every one second of video, you're going to get 30 frames. You're going to get 30 bitmap images. All right? So you're going to take that movie, and you're going to break it down into individual pictures, 30 of them for every second. Each one is either a bitmap, bitmap, or a JPEG, depending on whether you use the plugins or not. Bitmaps, as you may know, are memory hogs. So this will take some memory. So it might come back and give you a warning and say you don't have enough space on your hard drive for all of this stuff. If that's true, take that video clip and break it up into individual components. Five seconds of the Wolverine. 10 seconds of the pronghorn, whatever, and then do it individually like that. But you're going to extract all of the frames. Each frame is 1 30th of a second in duration. Okay? All right. Then, once you've done that, that's where the fun begins. What you're going to do For each animal, and th this graph paper is just for example, I do have some better graph paper somewhere, but I don't have it at the moment. What you're going to do for each little sequence, you're going to fill this piece of graph paper in this way. Each animal is going to take up four rows of graph paper. And then you're going to leave an empty row. And then another four rows. So you have four rows. There's one, two, three, 
and 4. Each square represents 1 30th of a second, and so on. This one is going to be left rear, left front, right front, right rear. You're going to look at the video, starting with the very first image where you have a clear view of all four legs, and you're going to look which legs are in contact with the ground. Left rear, right rear. You go to the next picture, 1 30th of a second later. It's this one, you just color them in or put an X in there. Next one, it's that one. Okay? Next one, there's nothing. Next one, it's that one. Next one, it's that one and that one. That one, that one, that one. Then it's this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, something like that. You're going to come up with a pattern that looks like that. So each series of X's represents when that foot is in contact with the ground. And each of these things right here is 1 30th of a second, so one frame. One frame. Each of those is one frame. Okay? When you look at this, you're going to be able to figure out which gait the animal is using. Is it using a gallop? Is it using a rotary gallop? Is it using a trot, a canter, a bound? What's it using? Okay? Contralateral, bilateral, what is it using? Okay? Then, what you're going to do, you're going to try and get five complete strides. Maybe you'll only get two, maybe you'll only get three, whatever. From here to there is going to be one stride. Okay? And so on. So if you can get five of those, fantastic. Maybe you can only get four, maybe you can only get three, maybe you can only get two, okay? Get as many as you can. If you can get ten, phenomenal. Then what you're going to do is you're going to figure out what the duty factor is for each limb. So the duty factor is the percentage of time that that limb was in contact with the ground. So all you're going to do, if this is where you're starting right here, you're going to count up the number of frames out of the total that that X was in that box. So if we're stopping, if we stop, I don't want to stop right there, but if we stop right there, we would have one, two, three, four out of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, I guess that's 10. We'll have to be consistent. Let's stop it right there, okay? Then it would be out of 10. So 4 out of 10. So the duty factor for that leg would be 0.4. You're going to do that for each foot. And then you're going to take those four, and you're going to classify. You're going to take the average for across all four feet. Maybe this one is 0.39, maybe this one is 0.2, maybe that one is 0.25 or something. You're going to take the average of those four numbers and that then gives you your average duty factor. If the average duty factor is less than 0.5, it's a run. If it's greater than 0.5, it's a walk. So initially we just divided, was this a run or was it a walk? Then we're going to look at it and we're going to try and determine based on the diagram that we have in the, in the handout that you got last time, we're going to try and determine what kind of a gait was it? A trot, a canter, an amble, okay, what was it? You said less than 0.5 is a run. Less than 0.5 is a run. In other words, the feet are in contact with the ground less than half the time. That's how we define a run.
that make sense? Everyone's with me on that. Okay. How much time do I have? Probably have lots. Good. Can I take 45 minutes of your time and continue the lecture that we had from last time? Are you guys going, oh, hell no, get me out of here? I, I would, if I can, I would just like to finish up uh, the business about the transition to land uh, for that first amphibian radiation. So for next time, do you just want us to have that video? So, ready so for? yeah, for um, you have the biomechanics handout or the, the um, that handout from last time, right? And you have no questions on that handout. We're all good to go on that handout. I, I wasn't here, so. Okay, I will. I will give you a copy of the handout right after class. Okay. So you have that. Then there's no way. There's no way you're going to get this done by Tuesday. It's unlikely that you're going to get it done by Thursday. If by Thursday you have Earth and View set up and you've got your video clips trimmed and you've got your frames extracted, you'll be golden. We can sit in class and we can start working through it in class to make sure you've, you've, you're getting it right. Okay. But by the end of next Thursday, I'd like to be able to have all of this done so we can get this part of it done in class. But if over the next few days you get Earth in view, get your video clips edited, and extract your frames, that would be great. Question? So you said uh, the duty factor for each link, calculate that by how again? The duty factor is however many. 30th of a second frames you have, oh. right? For each limb, for the right rear, how many, in how many of those frames, what percentage of the frames do you have an X? Even if it's like multiple strides? Yes. Okay, so yeah, you, if, you get, if you have 10 strides, that's fantastic because then your numbers are going to be really good. Okay. So this if you have only one stride, your numbers are going to be, yeah. So the ten, the ten frames was just an example. For yes. The sake of an example. Yes, that's right. Okay. If you get twenty strides, that's awesome. Okay. On some of these guys, you might only get two. Yeah. All right. next week. Okay. Just put uh, the methods. It's, yeah, it's methods and results. Okay, at this point you're not worrying about the introduction or discussion. Just methods and results. by talking about uh, the circulatory system uh, and the transition from a two-chambered heart to um, the four-chambered heart that you have in mammals. And we talked about the implications of that 
uh, and why it is that we have that and how important it is to the whole concept of terrestrial realization. So that's what that first amphibian radiation is all about. The first radiation of amphibians occurred um, before uh, the end Permian mass extinction event, right? And that first radiation of amphibians was large animals, okay? So they're huge. The other interesting thing about that first radiation of amphibians is that their heads were large. So the head oftentimes made up 25% or even a third of the total body length. Why do you think that is? Well, what, what is life all about? What's the purpose of life? Yeah, to do it again. Okay? So in order to do it again, you need to do two things. Number one, you need to reproduce. Number two, in order to reproduce, you need to eat. So life is all about processing food and reproduction. So when you're looking at organisms, you need to think about them in terms of those two things. Right? How do they manage food acquisition, food processing? Number two, how do they manage reproduction? So in that first radiation of amphibians, the big heads is all about food processing. So with having a big head, you can manage a lot of food and they probably were not particularly efficient, so they had to have big heads. Interestingly enough, every radiation of vertebrates, every radiation of vertebrates has experimented with gigantism. So the first amphibians were giant. The earliest reptiles were giant, the dinosaurs, right? The earliest mammals were giant. The earliest birds, things like ostriches and emus, they're giant. So every group has experimented with gigantism. Why? Because being big is easy. If you're big, the calories you need per gram is less than if you're small. If you're a shrew, you're going to starve to death if you don't eat within a couple of hours. If you weigh 650 pounds, you miss a couple of weeks worth of food, you're going to be just fine. Okay? So there's a dip, it, size matters, it's critical. It's easy to be big, you can be inefficient and be big. You cannot be inefficient and be small. So that first radiation of amphibians was likely not particularly efficient, but it was okay because they're big. The second radiation of amphibians comes about after the end Permian mass extinction event. In the end, Permian mass extinction event, 95% of all species on the planet went extinct. So following that mass extinction, there is a huge adaptive radiation. And that's what leads to the second group of not only amphibians, but also the reptiles and the mammal-like reptiles. Okay? So in the extent that second group of amphibians, we have three groups. One are these guys, the, Uris, uh, the Uridils, those are the salamanders. If you're a student or a, you know, you've, you've had courses with uh, Dusty Siegel, then you know all about salamanders, right? So this is um, one of the ambistomatid salamanders. This is the salamander that we have right here in Missouri, ambistom immaculatum, the spotted salamander. I call them those the backyard. Yeah, they're, they're <laughs> awesome. They're cool, and an interesting thing about these guys is the colors that they have on their backs. There's a lot of geographic variation in those color patterns. The problem that we have in trying to deal with that is describing colors is very difficult. So there are some people that, especially, um, there, there was a guy at Central Missouri State University that spent his whole career working on the color the color uh, variation in these guys. Um, and he was interested in color photography. So color photographers have these things called color wheels. Um, and he would match his color wheels against those trying to determine exactly how much cyan, magenta, and I've forgotten what the other one is. Uh, cyan, magenta, and uh, I think it's just yellow. Yellow, yellow. or something. Yeah, yellow. <laughs> So he, he would do that and come up with these ratios and do those descriptions, but it's not a very precise way of doing it, right? I think today the technology is probably better. 
Um, but we have those guys. Um, so all of the modern guys are referred to as the lis amphibian. Okay, so lis means smooth or without scales. Now, amphibians don't drink, but they absorb water via the skin. Okay, so they're picking up moisture. And if you've ever noticed things like chorus frogs, uh, and you've caught a chorus frog, and you have a little moisture in the palm of your hand, they will squat down and put the ventrum right into that moisture that's pooled in the bottom of your hand, and they will absorb that moisture. Okay, so there's water transport uh, via the in, uh, via the integument. Okay. Um, it also water also evaporates across the skin, and what that means then is that where you find these guys. Uh, it's going to tell you something about what the um, hybrid uh, qualities of the habitat are. So you're not going to find chorus frogs out in the middle of the Sonoran or Mojave Desert. Yet, you will find toads out in the Mojave Desert. There's a toad called the spadefoot toad. We have spadefoot toads here in Missouri as well. Uh, the genus is Scaphiopus. Uh, but the spadefoot toads that we have here are a different species than um, the toad that's out in the Mojave. What's cool about the spadefoot toad in Mojave, in the Mojave Desert, is the only time you see them is after a significant rainfall. So if you're out in the Mojave and you had a really good rainfall, you get up the next morning and you go visit all these little pools of water everywhere, and you'll find spadefoot toads in the pools. And if that pool lasts long enough, if it lasts a week or a little bit more, these guys will go through their entire reproductive cycle in that one week, two week period. So these guys are going to fill up with water, okay, and then as the pool begins to dry up, they burrow back down underneath the soil into the sand, and they slough off their skin. Their skin becomes a cocoon that's filled with water, they're going to live inside that water-filled cocoon until the next rainfall. It might be several years before they come out again. So their entire life cycle takes place when there's water in that pool. And that's it. Okay. Cool, cool, cool animals. They have the Australian Aborigine. Are you guys familiar with Mason Williams and who Mason Williams was? I don't know if he's still alive or not. Uh, he wrote a piece of music called Classical Gas. It's a little guitar piece. You should go listen to it. It's on YouTube. Look up Mason Williams' Classical Gas. It's a very cool little guitar. He also wrote a lot of poetry, not poetry, but prose, I guess you would call it. He has a poem called uh, Toad Suckers. I'll, I'll bring it in and read it to you. But it's a poem about the Australian Aborigines that suck toads. So the Australian Aborigines, in the outback, they know where all these pools are. In the pools, it's desert, the Great Victoria Desert. These pools dry up. So what these Aborigines do is they'll find these dried up pools, and they'll dig up the toads. They'll grab the toad, and the toad is just filled with water. The bladder is just filled with urine. But because they're amphibians, they don't have the ability to concentrate their urine hardly at all. So you can take these guys, and this is what the, they do, is they'll take them, put their mouth right over the cloaca of the toad, squeeze the toad, and force all the urine out of the bladder of the toad into their mouth, and they drink the urine. But it's almost, it's sterile for one thing, and number two, it's almost pure water. They're called toad suckers, okay? Um, the anurans, uh, this is a wood frog. Uh, wood frogs, we do get them in, um, in Missouri, uh, but we are at the, extreme, at the extreme southern distribution of their, the extreme southern limit of their distributional range. Um, I was at a, at a conference in Pennsylvania uh, with the uh, Carnegie Institute years ago. Uh, and there was this rich guy that hosted a sort of a, a social gathering for all the people that participated in this um, conference out at his estate. 
And at the bottom of, you know, his house stood up on this hill, and at the bottom of the hill was this pond. And we're out on his, uh, his big elaborate porch at the back of the house, you know, drinking cocktails and smoking cigars and stuff like that. And there are all these frogs calling in that pond. And I'm sitting there listening, and I turn to the, the owner of this house, and I say, you know, if I didn't know better, I'd swear those were wood frogs down there. And he looks at me and he says, oh yeah, that's exactly the, what they are. And I go, holy smokes. And of course, coming from Missouri, you almost never hear these guys because they're exceedingly rare. But you go up a little farther north, and they're like dirt common. What makes these guys so interesting is you can freeze them solid, and they'll survive. In Canada, right, these guys, they'll dig down under the leaf litter, and in the winter, they're little frogsicles. They're frozen totally solid. And when the spring thaw comes along, they thaw out, and they're good to go. Think about what that means, what kind of a challenge that presents. What would happen to you if we took you, locked you up in a minus 80, minus, well, we won't go minus 80, a minus 4 freezer, and froze you good and stiff? It's OK. We're going to pull you out in a couple of months and thaw you out. What would happen to you? All of our cell membranes would be ruptured. All your cell membranes would be ruptured. You'd be dead. OK? So how does this guy survive? Uh, it doesn't allow the crystals to form. Yeah, so the animal is using some sort of an antifreeze, right, which prevents the formation of water crystals so that when he freezes, the cells don't expand, okay? So the cells don't rupture. Great. The cells haven't ruptured. You're still frozen solid. And now we're going to lay you out on the lab table in this nice warm room and wait for you to thaw out. What if we could do that to you? I mean, that's the whole strategy behind cryogenesis, right? We're going to save your ass from this weird disease. We're going to freeze you put you in this nitrogen tank and whatnot, or we're going to save your eggs or your sperm, freeze them at minus 80, it'll all be good, and then we're going to thaw it out when you're ready to get pregnant or something, okay? Same strategy. Now, there we are. We pulled you out of the freezer, and now we want to thaw you out. What's going to happen? None of your cell membranes have, have burst. You're fine. Haven't you ever... ever purchase something that was frozen, you put it in the oven, you bake it according to, or you, you broil it according to the instructions, you take it out of the oven, you carve into it, the surface is really nice and hot and done, you get to the middle and it's still raw. What happened? It doesn't heat from the inside out, it heats from the outside in. Think about what that means. There you are, your cells begin to thaw out on the surface, and as soon as the cells on the surface are thawed, they need blood. They need oxygen. But they're not getting any because your heart is still frozen. It's not pumping. So the rest of your body thaws out, thaws out, thaws out. The last thing to thaw out is going to be the core of the body. The last thing to thaw and start pumping is the heart. And by the time the heart thaws out and pumps, the rest of the body is dead. So obviously, these guys are doing something, because they don't die. The weird thing is, and we don't understand how that happens, and that would make a glorious doctoral dissertation, is figuring out how these guys thaw out. Because when they thaw out, they thaw out from the inside out. Which is really weird. It's a trick that we haven't figured out. All right, the next group of amphibians are uh, the Sicilians. And these guys are truly bizarre. Looks like an earthworm. If it were not for the color pattern, it would look like an earthworm. Why does it look like an earthworm? It doesn't have any legs. And it has these annular rings all around the body. In fact, when I took general zoology, the guy that was teaching the general zoology class was just like, well, he weighed about 300 pounds more than Tim Judd. 
But he was a nice guy. He was really smart. Everybody really liked him. Um, but 95% of the course was all about invertebrates. And like in the last two weeks, we talked about vertebrates. And in his very first vertebrate lecture, he's talking about you know, amphibians, fishes, and amphibians. And he puts up this slide with a Sicilian on it, and he says, and here's an earthworm. And he goes, wait a minute. Oh, I must have put the wrong slide in. But no, he didn't. It was a Sicilian, OK? But it looks that much like an earthworm. The only thing that's missing is what? Limbs. Or no. Sorry. What's that? What's that thing called? That band that goes around the earthworm? Clitellum. The, the, right. How's it pronounced again? I think it's clitellum. Clitellum? Clitellum? No, clitellum? Sure. Something like that? Sure. It's that, that band, right? That's the only thing that's missing. Where are the eyes? The eyes are reduced and covered with skin. Okay? It has an underhung jaw, so the jaw, the lower jaw, is behind the upper jaw. The top of the skull is totally reinforced because they're using their skull to dig. So it has a really robust little skull, has this underhung jaw so they can open their jaw up. There are no external ear openings, there are no eye openings. There are no limbs, and they have internal fertilization, and they give birth to live young. The young are in eggs inside, they hatch inside, and the young, once they're born, are going to feed on the skin of the female. So she's going to shed her skin, and the offspring are going to feed on her skin. So that's maternal investment. Okay, so there are about 4,600 species of modern amphibians, but that number is shrinking rapidly. As you probably know, amphibians are not doing well with climate change. Uh, there are all these weird fungal diseases that are affecting amphibians. Um, they are disappearing at um, a rapid rate. Okay, so as we said before, the first amphibian radiation produced large form. This the second radiation is small forms. The small, these amphibians are not primitive by any stretch of the imagination. When we think of vertebrates, we always have a tendency to think of fish and amphibians as being primitive, and mammals and birds as being advanced. That's not true. Every amphibian species alive today is fully modern. Okay? It just has a different body plan. They're still here. The ones that are here are successful. Okay? So let's not fall into that um, adaptationist uh, trap. OK, so they're all tied to water in some form or another. Uh, probably the group that is least tied to water are going to be the uh, Sicilians. Um, they all have gas exchange via the skin. The lungs are simple, this, these sac-like sac structures. right? Um, they do not have the ability to concentrate urine. Um, the epidermis uh, is very thin, okay, and the reason they do that is that they can breathe across the skin, and they have glands in the skin. They have multiple different kinds of glands in the skin. If we look at salamanders, uh, the, there are a couple of interesting forms. Uh, most of them have four limbs, although not all. In some salamander forms, uh, the appendages are reduced, and you see that here with this guy, right? Uh, that's Amphiuma tridactylum. It has three toes right there. Okay? There's also Amphiuma didactylum, which has only two toes. There's the limb. There's the humerus. There's the radius and the ulna. That little time. Why do some animals have small limbs? They don't use them. Well, so if you don't use a part of your body, does it just sort of shrink and disappear? Well, your muscles do, but aside from that, don't use your testicles so they just shrink and disappear. Well, I don't, this is not personal. I'm not pointing. <laughs> well, I'm, not, I'm just referring to like uh, I'm just referring to like over time, like 
if they like a if the species like doesn't get any uh, well, the, like think if, about the, your the pinky finger. You don't use your pinky finger, and yet you still have it. Yeah. There's no selection pressure against it. So it seems to imply that there is selection pressure against the limbs. That's why they're disappearing. What might that selection pressure be? Uh, limbs represent uh, a surface that can be grappled. Or that can get in the way, or can get tangled up. The one thing we know about organisms that have small limbs, and that's true for amphibians, and reptiles, and mammals, right, is that they live in complex habitats. So habitats where there's a lot of stuff that gets in the way. A lot of rocks, a lot of brush, a lot of that kind of stuff. Under those circumstances, animals shrink the limbs because they get in the way. That's the one common thing that we know. OK, um, there is this sort of interesting thing that goes on. There's a group of salamanders called the plethodontidae. And the plethodontid salamanders look different from the embistomatids. The very first picture of a salamander that I showed you, the spotted salamander, was this nice, bulky, bodybuilder, power lifter kind of a salamander, this big, robust, bodied animal. The plethodontid salamanders are like these little tiny pencil neck geeks, man. Little tiny skinny bodies with little tiny skinny legs and arms. Okay? It's a fundamentally different body form. I wonder why. It turns out that the plethodontid salamanders don't have lungs. So they're called the lungless salamanders. Why not have lungs? Well, for one thing, if, you, if you're really skinny, your surface area to volume ratio is going to be very high. So you can manage all your gas exchange across the skin without using lungs. If you're big and robust bodied, like Ambistema, you don't have enough surface area in order to get the oxygen you need. Great. So why be lungless? Why not be skinny and have lungs too? Then you could get more than enough oxygen and you could be really physically active. Well, there's only so much oxygen you can, like as we mentioned before with the blood. Yeah, there's a, there is a, you know, you can only saturate the blood to a certain point and at a certain rate. That's true. It turns out that the lungless salamanders tend to always be associated with water. The lungless salamanders tend to spend time in the water. Now think about what it means to have lungs and be in the water. Everybody in here, is there anybody in here that doesn't know how to swim? My wife doesn't know how to swim. I've tried to teach her, nah, it's not gonna work. You don't know, you don't swim, you don't like it, don't. I, I can like Doggy paddle, but that's about it. Yeah. My, my kids, when my son tried to learn how to swim, it was a challenge. It was really hard. He was terrified of water. Okay? Um, what some parents will do, and I don't recommend this, um, and I would never do it, I think it's sick, but they'll just take their kid and throw the kid in the water because they know the kid's going to be fine. How do they know the kid is going to be fine? Boingy's going to bob around on the surface like a cork, okay? Because he's got lungs full of air. Of course, if he goes face down and gets a lung full of water, then he's going straight to the bottom. But as long as he's taking those breaths with his head above water, he's going to be fine. And that's the same problem the salamander face. If he has lungs full of air, he can't get down to the bottom. And what plethodontid salamanders do is they feed at the bottom. So by not having lungs, they don't have to expend energy to get down to the bottom of the stream. So it's possible to be at the bottom and not expend any energy by being at the bottom. Now, flip that around a little bit and let's ask the question, who are the biggest salamanders? The biggest salamanders are these Japanese giant salamanders. These guys that get about six, seven, eight feet long. These guys are monsters. And they have lungs. How are they able to get that big? When you're that big, your surface area to volume ratio is really low. They're aquatic. Okay? How are they going to get enough oxygen? 
Yeah. Doesn't it have to do with the folds of their skin? They, their skin is really wrinkly, which increases the surface area. That's, that's one thing they do. What else? What kinds of water systems do you find them in? Fresh water. Yeah, fresh water. What else? In cold, fast-moving streams. Why cold and why fast-moving? How does a fast-moving stream differ from a slow-moving stream in terms of oxygen concentration? There's more oxygen in a fast-moving stream. Number two, why cold water, why not warm water? Same reason, there's more oxygen. Okay, but is there another thing going on? These animals are poikilothermic. <coughs> what does that mean? These guys, like, like most fish, not all fish, but like most fish, are poikilothermic. What that means is their body temperature is the same as the environmental temperature. You are homeothermic. Some animals are heterothermic. Okay. We can classify animals as being endothermic or ectothermic. Endothermic animals generate metabolic heat from within the animal, like mammals, most mammals, not all. Ectothermic animals get their heat from outside the animal, amphibians, reptiles, fish. Some fish, like tuna, are endothermic. Some reptiles, like sea turtles, are endothermic. Okay? Some reptiles, like varanids, are partially endothermic. Mammals are homeothermic, except human females, which are a little bit heterothermic, depending on their reproductive cycle. Some animals are strictly heterothermic. Some reptiles are homeothermic, at least during the summertime. Okay. Poikilothermic, their temperature is whatever the environmental temperature is. So these Japanese giant salamanders are poikilothermic. Why are they in cold water? What would happen if they were in warm water? Their metabolic rate would be higher. Oxygen demand would be higher. Oxygen concentration in the water would be lower. They wouldn't get enough oxygen. By being in cold water, their body temperatures are low, oxygen demand is low, oxygen supply in the water is high. Okay? There are some salamanders that are pedomorphic. What, does, what is pedomorphism? What is neoteny? What's pedomorphism? What's neoteny? Nobody knows? I assume that pedomorphism is when they show larval characteristics as adults. That's right. It's right, it's right there on the slide, man. <laughs> Give the man a cigar. So pedomorphism is the retention of juvenile characteristics in the adult form. Okay? What is neoteny? The opposite? Neoteny is the ability to reproduce as a juvenile. Wait a minute, you say, there's a problem. What's the problem? Uh, the line between juvenile and adult is 
defined by being able to sexually reproduce. So if you can reproduce, you're not a juvenile, you're an adult. Okay? So we no longer use the term neoteny. That was from a time in our biological history when we were confused. Okay? We now use the frame the, the phrase or the term pedomorphosis. So it's the retention of juvenile characteristics in the adult form. Mold salamanders and Bistema talpoidium is a facultative pedomorph. So in mold salamanders in Missouri, they're in a stream or in a pond rather, at the end of the season they have to make a decision. Are they going to go through metamorphosis and become adults or are they going to stay as juveniles in the water, so not go through metamorphosis? Well, if you metamorphose, you're going to lose the gills, you're going to become an adult, you're going to climb out of the pond, and you're going to overwinter in the leaf litter somewhere around the pond, which exposes you to shrews and mice and foxes and all that sort of stuff. If you stay in the water, everything will be neat and groovy, unless, of course, the pond dries up, in which case you're dead. So the salamander has an important decision to make. And the decision is going to be based on how sure the salamander is that the pond is going to stay wet. Because if you decide to stay and the pond dries up, you're dead. If you decide to leave and the pond stays wet, you lose. Because you might get eaten and or you now come back to the pond in the spring and the guys that overwintered in the pond go through metamorphosis very rapidly and are able to sexually reproduce before you even get back. So you come to the party late and all the fun has already started and everybody else already has a jump start on, re on reproduction. You're behind. So it's an important decision to make. There was a guy named Bray Semlich at Mizzou who has spent his whole career working on that question. He didn't start off at Mizzou. He was in uh, North Carolina when he began that research. And he moved out here to Mizzou because we were on the edge of the distributional range of mole salamanders. And he wanted to be at that location where he could really try to answer that question. And unfortunately, he died before he was able to answer that question. So there's another cool dissertation project waiting for your attention. OK. So um, we get these guys, these uh, axolotls, what's that, Nectaris, okay, uh, which retain their gills. Uh, that's an adult, but it retains the gills, so it's pedomorphic. Um, tra -tra -tra. Let's uh, look a little bit at the functional diversity that takes place in, um, in frogs. This is a, a narrow mouth toad. It's called a narrow mouth toad because it has a really narrow mouth. Um, and it's got that you know also because it has that little fold on the back of its neck like a football player. You ever noticed how linemen in a, on a football team always have that fatty fold right at the back of their neck? You've never noticed that? Watch for it. It's there. Okay. So when you're eating four or five pizzas a day and, you know, taking in 6,000 calories a day, 9,000 calories a day and during football season, you get those fatty folds there. It's kind of cool. But these guys are really cool. That's an ant specialist. So these guys specialize. Their diet consists of ants. There are some lizards that do that as well. And the lizards and these guys have a problem. What family are the ants in? What's the name of the family for the ants? Any Tim Judd students here? What family do ants belong to? The family Formicidae. Why are they called the Formicids? What do ants produce? Formic acid. Okay. Formic acid is really nasty stuff. So these guys are eating ants, and somehow they've solved the problem of these high concentrations of formic acid. So when they digest those things, 
What the lizards do is they jack their body temperature really up high so that they can metabolically process the formic acid. We don't understand how these guys are able to handle the formic acid. But if you look at frogs and toads, there's this weird thing that goes on with their limbs. So you can look at limb, limb legs. So here are the fore limbs, and here are the hind limbs. So you can have long hind limbs and long fore limbs. And if you have that combination, you're going to be an animal that walks and jumps. Okay? If you have long hind limbs but um, short fore limbs, you're likely a swimmer. If you have long fore limbs and uh, short hind limbs, you're a walker or a hopper, okay? And if you have short forelimbs and short hindlimbs, you're a walker, a hopper, or and or a burrower, okay? So you can look at frogs and classify them in that way. Think for just a moment about why we think frogs are so cool. What is it that frogs do better than anybody else? I mean, the frogs that you encounter, why, why are... How many people like Mark Twain? Right? What's this whole thing about the jumping frogs of Calaveras County? What's that all about? There's a frog jumping contest in California, and Mark Twain writes about that contest. My herpetology professor, when I was at Cal State, always won that contest. Always. Every year he entered it, he won it because he knew what to do. <coughs> what he would do, he used bullfrogs, so a bigger frog, and he'd put the bullfrogs in the oven and get them nice and warm. And right before the contest would start, he'd take them out of his little portable oven and put them there, and they would always jump farther than anybody else's. Everybody else had these frogs that were cold, you know, 70 degrees, 60 degrees, 80 degrees. His were all at like 98 degrees, man. And they jumped like real, they jumped really good, okay? He's a herpetologist. He understood about poikilothermia, man. Nobody else had any clue what was going on. He always won. Frogs jump. Think about how a frog jumps, okay? What does it do? They tend to have, jumping frogs tend to have long back legs. And they sit there, their arms are like this, and they leap so the animal jumps, the back legs extend, the front legs go back, and while the frog is in midair, the front legs come like this, prepared to land, and the back legs come up so that when he lands, he's right away ready to jump again. How cool is that? I mean, everything is engineered to perfection, except that's not how jumping evolves. If you look at the oldest group of frogs we have, there are two species, Ascaphus trui, which is the tailed frog in the Pacific Northwest, and then Discoglossus, which is this frog in Australia. Those two guys are, are closely related, extremely um, ancient frogs. And when you look at how they jump, they jump fundamentally differently. So number one, they have tails. No other frog has a tail. And when these guys jump, they jump, the back legs extend and stay extended, the front legs stay back like this, and they belly flop. <laughs> they flop, man, and then slowly, as though they're on drugs, they'll bring the back front legs up, and they'll bring the back legs up, and then they'll decide if they're going to jump again. But they always belly flop. <coughs> so the ability to bring the limbs back and get them cocked, ready to jump again, is modern. That's not how they first did it. The question is, why? Why did those earliest frogs belly flop? And the answer is, why are they jumping? Because you don't have to jump to feed. You can walk to feed. Why are they jumping? Predation. To get away from a predator? Yeah, why? If they're belly flopping, it takes them forever to move their limbs back into yeah, but that's how the first ones did it. And it worked. Because they're still here. They've been around since the end of the Permian, man. 
They're still here. Where are the tailed frogs located? In extremely cold streams in northern Idaho and eastern Washington state. Northern eastern Washington state. And you always find them on the banks of these cold streams. So think about what that means. When they're jumping, they're not jumping onto the ground. They're jumping into the water. So if you jump into the water, you're entering the water like a bullet, okay, and now you're ready to swim. When you put them in the lab, they're doing the belly flop on your force plate or something. There's no water to jump into. A former graduate student from here named Rick Esner, uh, who's now at uh, SIU Edwardsville, um, that was his, uh, one of the first projects he completed after he got his PhD, the evolution of jumping in frogs. And he has this video clip. I'll try and dig up that video clip. But he had this paper that got published in Nature. And this video clip of his went viral. I don't know how many millions of times it's been watched. It's awesome. This little video clip of this tailed frog on a force plate jumping and doing this perfect belly flop. It's, it's a, and it's all in perfect slow motion. It's really cool. All right. So. Just very quickly, all frogs, except for these discoglossids and, and um, escapas, lack a tail. Okay? So anura means, the anurans, those are the frogs, means no tail. Well, escapistura has a tail. Why the hell do they have a tail? What do the hips look like in frogs? It's a V-shape, right? But how many sacral vertebrae do they have? Just one. How many do you have? Like three, four, five, six, seven. I think the armadillo back there has seven or nine. Okay? The more sacral vertebrae you have connecting up to your pelvic girdle, the more force you can deliver through that hip joint. Frogs only have one. That's a candy-ass connection. Not very good. They jump. They're imparting huge forces when they jump. How do they solve that problem? They take that first caudal vertebrae, fuse all those vertebrae together to form this thing called a urostyle, and bump it up against the back of the girdle, the ischium. So they actually, instead of having just two connections, they have three. So they've increased the connections by 50%. They make this tripod out of it. So they're improving the strength of that girdle. And it works. Okay. So why do they have a tail? Two reasons. One, they use the tail as a copulatory organ. Okay. No other frog does that. So it's basically like his little penis hanging off backwards, going off the end. Okay. And when they reproduce, we talked about earlier, we talked about inguinal amplexus, axillary amplexus, and cephalic amplexus. Do you remember that? Did it, was that this class that I talked about that? I think yes. Nice. These guys, don't get grossed out on me, they go butt to butt. They turn around, they back up, just like that. Okay? So they don't do any of those things. They do butt to butt. All right, uh, I'm going to skip, skip. This is a, a spade foot toad. Um, you can't see the spade on this picture very good. Uh, we have spade foot toads in Missouri. Uh, they too come out. Uh, they're down in the sand prairies down near East Prairie. Okay, there's a huge population of them down there. Um, I'm going to skip through all of these guys right here. Uh, I'm going to skip through all of that. Um, I'm going to skip through all of that. I'm going to skip through all of that. We've already done all of that. And I'm going to stop right there, okay? Um, so we've now covered the transition to land. Uh, the next lecture that we do, we're going to start talking about the evolution of um, the reptiles, okay? And we'll talk about dinosaurs for a little bit, a little bit about 
the history of herpetology, uh, just because it's fun. And uh, then we'll start talking about birds and mammals. Okay. Uh, so for lab, uh, urban view, um, I will post those video clips this evening. Your job over the weekend before next Thursday um, is to edit those video clips down. If you can't, if you can't manage it with the software, come and talk to me. We'll figure out a way to do it. Okay. Extract the frames. Come in with frames on a thumb drive or something like that, or a portable hard drive, so that we can begin working with them. Okay. Awesome. See you guys next week. Go in and see um, Kathy. Um, what time do we have? Yeah, I will go see her in a couple of minutes and okay. turn all that paperwork in. Okay. I was just making sure it looked fine, didn't it? Yeah, okay. it looks good. We're, we're all good. Did you get my email yesterday? I did. I haven't read it yet, but I did get it. But I figured that uh, you you were behind, so. Yeah.